So it's Sunday, and the only thing I'm going to talk about on this video is AJ's Weekend Movie Reviews. That's right, due to the fact that we only had two last week, AJ gave me four for this week. That's right, four movie reviews for this week. So we're going to be talking about Oz, the Great and Powerful first, and we're going to get to that one first. So, once again... As usual, these are AJ's opinions. They may reflect mine, they may not. It just kind of depends on the day or the movie in particular. And uh, these are his reviews. And let's get started. So, Oz the Great and Powerful. To say I was underwhelmed by the existence of this movie would be an understatement. I hated they were going to attempt to take us as an audience, back to Oz in a Burton-y kind of way. I also hated that it was going the prequel route, which is never a good idea. I also didn't like the fact that it was going to be directed by Sam Raimi, who I find to be horribly overrated, and the casting of James Franco and Mila Kunis in such a story was baffling. This was a recipe for disaster. Or so I thought. In an opening that is nothing short of magical, we're in Kansas. The picture is black and white and in the old school standard aspect ratio. They even do something I love from the original movie by having actors playing two separate roles in both Kansas and Oz that mirror each other in some way. Everything looks uncannily like a movie from the 1930s. We meet Oz, who is, a brilliant, who is as brilliant as a magician as he is a total fraud. After being shamed off the stage when he can't make a crippled girl walk again, a twister comes and whisks his hot air balloon to the land of Oz. In a magnificent transition, as he floats towards Oz, the color starts to fade in and the standard picture expands to widescreen. It's a wonder for the eyes. Though that opening seemed impossible to live up to for the following two hours, the movie sure tried its damnedest to do so, and to not commend it for that would be inhuman. Everything in Oz is breathtaking to behold. From the endless fields of exotic flowers, to the tall hills, the strange creeper, creatures that there seem to be a constant sunset. Once there, he meets Theodora, which is Mila Kunis, who seems like a sweet girl until she quickly grows a fatal attraction as fondness for him. She takes him to the Emerald City, which is much more sinister than you probably remember, as this is back when the throne was held by Wicked Witch of the East, Evanora, Rachel Wise. Oz is told by Evanora that if he finds and kills the Wicked Witch, we will become, sorry, he will become the Wizard of Oz, and also become owner of the Treasure of Oz, which is a giant room filled with gold. Now with that in mind, he sits out on his quest with his faithful monkey servant, Finley, a hilarious motion capture performance by Zach Braff, and a small living china doll that he saved from her destroyed village. There is a great scene where Oz comes to terms with not being able to help the crippled girl from the beginning by gluing the china doll's legs back together and helping her walk again. Both the girl and the china, girl, china doll are played by Joey King. Now they quickly learn they have been tricked by Evanora as they discover the witch that they've been sent to kill is actually Glinda the Good, played to perfection by Michelle Williams. Now once they learn what is really going on, they rally together to stop Evanora from claiming Oz as her own forever, but are too late to save Theodora, who has already been turned into what we all know to be the Wicked Witch of the West. Though I rave about this movie, it does have some problems here and there. Now, first and foremost, Rachel Wise. I've never liked this woman as an actress, and here she is really bad. You can expect blandness and bores anytime she's on screen, which thankfully isn't that much. Another problem, the Wicked Witch of the West. Mila does play the part very well. She could have endlessly borrowed from Margaret Hamilton, but it is clear she did her best to make the part her own. Her wicked laugh is just as haunting as Hamilton's, which is an incredible feat, as that laugh is the stuff of movie legend. The main problem, though, is her face. It looks like they went half ass CG crazy on her face, making it look fake and quite ridiculous. It's okay, I guess, when we see her at a distance, but up close, she looks like an unfinished special effect. They should have just put her in full makeup. Now, all that seems so minor, though, when you look at the rest of this feast for the eyes and imagination. 
Everything looks magnificent, including the darker Emerald City, which could have come off hokey in a time where everyone wants to make darker fairy tales. It's also a great relief to see a movie so effects-heavy and not seem so fake. I mean, I'm not saying you feel like you can reach out and touch things because the effects are so good, but nothing looks artificial. There's also a perfectly fitting, memorable Danny Elfman score. Franco is very impressive in a role that everyone seems to question him taking, but you can take a look back at the original movie. The wizard is a slimy con man, who you could somehow still grow to love. Sounds like James Franco to me. He was perfect for the part. I've already raved about Michelle Williams, but I have to say again, I cannot imagine a more perfect Glinda. And the best part is that it's a movie that after having to follow the classic Hollywood movie, I can see it far down the road being a classic in itself. Dead Man Down. Dead Man Down is the story of Victor, played by Colin Farrell, a lackey for Alphonse Hoyt, which is Terrence Howard, who works for some very powerful criminals. Shortly after our violent opening shootout that reminded me a lot of the great underseen 2006 Paul Walker movie, Running Scared, we meet Victor's neighbor from across the building, Beatrice, which is Numi Rapace. They have what appears to be a sweet little romance until she reveals that she saw him kill somebody, and she attempts to blackmail him into killing the drunk driver that crashed into her and disfigured her. However, this is just the beginning of a story with many layers, and that makes me wary about what I can say, as I have no idea when we'd be crossing the line into spoilers. I will confess that for the first hour of the movie or so, I had no idea what the hell was going on. I was uncertain whose side Victor was on, and I had no idea if Beatrice was a troubled girl in need of love, or just an annoying psychopath. I wasn't sure who the character played by F. Murray Abraham was. I felt totally lost as I tried desperately to catch up. The whole movie seemed all over the place, bouncing back and forth from about four different plot points that seemed totally parallel and unrelated. However, once everything unravels and starts to fall into place, every plot point comes together and everything makes sense and it feels quite rewarding. Well, there are still a few things that I would have changed, though. There's this character named Darcy, played by Dominic Cooper. He's a friend of Victor's and has even granted Victor as the godfather of his baby. Now, the odd thing, though, where the movie screws up with this character is they give him a baby and a wife so we can hope and pray he doesn't die. Trouble is, this guy is so annoying and such a thug. I put the wife and baby aside, and was kind of hoping to see him get plugged. It also confuses me that Beatrice revenge and hated stem, sorry, Beatrice revenge and hatred stem from her disfigurement. And the scars are supposedly so bad that kids throw rocks and other assorted things at her and call her monster, the even carved monster into her apartment door. This is weird to me because the damage to her face really isn't that bad. From a distance, you can barely notice. But well, there's a scene where she is looking back at old pictures of herself, remembering when she was beautiful. The pictures don't look that different. She even got rid of her job at a beauty salon because she shouldn't be giving advice on beauty. It's a few scars. Calm down, drama queens. There are a few memorable scenes, starting with the shootouts that bookend the movie. Both are a no-holds-barred and happen when you least expect them to. <coughs> Excuse me. There is also a scene that is hard to watch, despite the fact that the no blood is shown where Pharaoh has a man tied to a chair and unleashes an army of rats on him. <coughs> Excuse me. The best scene of the movie, however, is a totally engaging, heart-pounding, edge-of-your-seat scene where Alphonse invites Victor over to have a talk. And we have no idea what Alphonse knows and what he doesn't. It's a great scene. Rapace reteaming with her girl in the Dragon Tattoo director, I was kind of underwhelmed by. I loved her in Dragon Tattoo, as well as Prometheus, but here I just really wasn't drawn in by her. However, Farrell and Howard are the t at the top of their game. Farrell brings on a convincingly complex array of emotions, from bloodthirsty to vulnerable to heartbroken. Howard is incredible as a villainous Alphonse, being threatening in both the yelling, screaming way and the calm, collective way, as demonstrated in the scene I mentioned earlier. There's also an interesting casting choice in French cinema royalty Isabel Huppert as Beatrice's loopy mother. 
Oh, and wrestler Wade Barrett has a very minor role as one of Alphonse's thugs, so don't get too worried when you see the WWE Studios logo at the beginning. From what I understand, they had no say in the script and signed on pretty much as filming was beginning. So, as long as you have patience and you like the idea of putting the puzzle pieces of a movie together, you'll probably love this movie. It's definitely a movie that will benefit from being watched again, and I'm very curious to see if my opinion goes up even more when that time comes. Now let's delve into the ABCs of death. If there's one genre I really love and want to see more of, it's the anthology film. These are movies like Creepshow or VHS, as well as comedies like Woody Allen's Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Sex But Were Afraid to Ask, or one of the worst movies of this year, Movie 43. However, I have come to terms with the fact that as much as I love this genre, it's very difficult to pull off. Maybe that's why I love it so much when it's done right. The ABCs of Death, unfortunately, is one that is lost. They gathered 26 different directors and gave them complete artistic freedom, as on-screen text tells us at the beginning. This was clearly not a good idea, as a lot of these directors have proven they should never have been given creative control on full-length projects of their own, let alone 25 other ones that 25 other people are involved in. The concept is pretty easy to grasp. Each director was assigned a letter of the alphabet, and they had to choose a word that starts with that letter as a way of death and make a short film about it. Seems simple enough. Though this is advertised as a horror movie, and with a poster that looks very horror-like, a surprising number of these aren't played for horror. This upset quite a few horror fans when this played at the Toronto International Film Festival back in September. I guess I'll start by telling you what few segments are actually worth a damn. As I do this, I'm not going to tell you what each letter stands for, as a lot of the fun of the movie is trying to guess throughout the segment what the word is. The best and most memorable of the bunch, the letter D. It is very brutal and a bit hard to watch, but it's also so stylishly done as a very interesting mind-bender concept. Too bad the only truly great segment came so early. The letter V is quite odd and stands out as it is set in a futuristic world, much like a low-budget version of the world in Dread. It involves infertile humans, killer robots, and a deadly baby. Sounds trippy, doesn't it? Q is pretty funny, involving the directors of the segment trying to figure out what to do with being given one of the most difficult letters to work with. The end result? Pretty humorous. S talking about humorous, the letter N is a bizarrely funny bit about a man with a talking bird he probably wishes didn't talk so much. Letter S starts off like a no-budget Mad Max ripoff, but descends into something else, providing an undeniably interesting twist. That's about it for the ones that are decent. Then we go into stuff like the letter I, which is just nonsensical symbolism. The letter C, which is like a brainless, murderous Groundhog Day. Z, in which a Japanese Dr. Strangelove witnessed strange acts that are sexually explicit, as they are with gore. I particularly hate the segments that are trying to be preachy or say they are a statement on something. The letter R has a particularly intriguing thing going on before it turns into some abstract statement on something. You really have no idea what. Then you have your ones that are disgusting and repulsive just for the sake of it, like H, J, W, and especially Y, which involves a creepy old janitor with big eyes who loves to molest children and lick the puddles of sweat off the bench after a big basketball game. When they aren't being repulsive just for the sake of it, we fall in the category of so disturbing and gruesome, it's totally unwatchable. L and X. I do commend the directors that tried to do something new and creative, Though it doesn't really amount to anything. The letter O, impressively shot, and there are a couple of in interesting segments told in a first-person point-of-view style. And there are two animated segments, one claymation bit that is bizarre and funny in an offbeat kind of way. The other, I'm not really sure what the makers were thinking. There was a particularly disappointing segment, as was directed by Ty West, the up-and-coming horror director that made The House of the Devil and last year's The Innkeepers. His segment, about 30 seconds long, and he seemingly did not care about this project at all. As far as letter F is concerned, don't ask. Please, I'm begging you, don't ask. That's about it. Anyone I failed to mention, probably forgettable and minor. This seemed to be such a great idea on paper, but getting mostly directors that really shouldn't be taking part in this kind of thing was a big mistake. I'd like to see this tackled on by 24 other directors. Maybe two from this movie are allowed to stay on. 
I suppose you can check it out if you have absolutely no control over your curiosity. But don't say you weren't warned. Go watch Creep Show or check out VHS instead. Now, I've been told that this next review is pretty long. And if I remember correctly, AJ told me that this review spanned two notebook pages when he wrote it originally. So I'm really interested to see what's going to be discussed in The Last Exorcism 2. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me tell you pretty much everything you need to know about this entire movie by explaining the opening scene. Okay, there's a couple that we have never seen before laying in bed. While the girl gets up to go to the bathroom, something crawls into the bed with the guy. Sure, the way whatever the thing is breathes and sounds is kind of eerie, but of course he talks to it like it's the girl. Now, I figured the movie figured we were smart enough to know that, of course, that isn't the girl. It's something else. The woman then appears in the doorway of the bathroom and says, Who are you talking to? And the music gets really loud and the guy's a revelation. revelation. Yeah, about that loud music. So the makers of this thought we would just think that the girl in bed next, it was the girl next, that, wow. We would think just to think that was the girl in bed next to him. Like we would have no idea. This leads to some cheap jump scares until we finally see what all this fuss is about. It's a possessed girl who has curled herself up on the kitchen counter. Then they show us the title of the movie and the film begins. Oh yeah. By the way, that scene and the couple never come back. Ever. Now before we move on to the story, I'd like to take some time to examine the jump scare. We are all way too way familiar with it. A character will walk around in the dark as a soft, creepy score plays, but just as something is about to jump out, the score will completely change and there's complete silence for a few seconds, an effect to make the scare seem louder than when it happens, thus making the audience jump. Now, you'll notice when you look at it from that perspective, what's really the point? It's never what is jumping out of the darkness, nor is it the timing of the scare or how it's executed. You are jumping because the speakers are pounding in a loud music chord in your ears in a silent room. That's it. There's a jump scare in Mama, the horror movie released this past January. That was the perfect way to do it. You didn't use mu music or amp up the sound. They simply showed you the monster and what the monster did in that scene. Made you jump back in your seat, making you feel like you were about to be attacked. That's how you do it. This movie abuses the jump scare more than any movie I've seen in the past few years. And since it's Z-grade horror's most overused crutch, that is quite the accomplishment. Now people in the room with her so much say, so much as say something to her, and she jerks her head to look at them like they came out of nowhere when they were right there the whole time. She can't even walk down the sidewalk without a random dog jumping at the fence to bark at her. As many times as someone talking made her look at them like they jumped out and scared her. I'm surprised she didn't snap something in her neck. Anyway, maybe I should just tell you about the rest of the movie now. First, we get a recap of everything that happened in the last movie through footage. But clearly the actors wanted nothing to do with this sequel, as every non-returning actor's face is not shown in the archive footage. That was a great first sign. Nell, Ashley Bell, the girl that was possessed in the first movie, is now the only survivor and she moves in with some people that are never really identified, but I'm assuming they're distant family or something? Of course, they shrug it off every they shrug off everything from the first movie and don't believe any of it. And get angry when it's mentioned. In true stupid horror movie character fashion, she goes to her room and meets Gwen, Julia Garner. Though Gwen appears to be about the age a teener, teenager grows up and stops being a rebel, the very first thing she says to this girl she has never met before is FREAK. She then proceeds to make fun of her by calling her backwoods and other variations of the sort. Look, I know kids can be cruel and bullying is a very big issue, but do you know anyone that this, a this age will immediately jump into insulting someone to their face that they've never even met before that isn't under the age of 12 or has a mental disability? But that's not what baffles me the most. In the ne very next scene, Nell is hanging out with Gwen and her friends like they are best buddies. I assume we're supposed to assume that they keep her around to ridicule and laugh at, but you don't really see that when they're out and about. This, however, has made her even more confusing in a later scene when they all watch the exorcism video of her on YouTube and smirk and giggle at her like bullies. Who the hell's side are they on? 
In another baffling plot point, Nell meets up with Chris, which is Spencer Treat Clark, you know, the kid from Gladiator. Excuse me. Now, I don't know if I blacked out or spaced off or it just went past me, but Nell meets up with Chris like they had a date, and he's a character, he's been around. I seriously do not recall him in the slightest prior to the scene where they meet up. He wasn't in the first movie that I recall, and I don't remember to have an explanation as to how the hell they know each other or seem to have for a while. Who the hell is this guy? I was thinking he was the creepy human statue he attempted to hit on for whatever the hell reason, but if he was, how we know that this was lost on me? Anyway, she is starting to realize that the demon that possessed her has some unfinished business and wants to take over her body again. She is helped by her father. Yes, you remember correctly, he did die in the first one, but Nell doesn't care. As shown in this gem of a scene, baby, I'm here. Dad? But you died. I had to find you before they did. And she lets it go with that. Not going along with what I think should have been an obvious follow-up. I'm glad you were able to find me. Dad, but you died. After meandering in pointless jump scares for a straight hour, the movie finally abruptly decides to move along by literally having the know-it-all character appear out of nowhere and help. You know what character I mean, that character in horror movies that knows every little detail about everything that's going on that will explain everything to us in one scene of boring exposition. This character literally walks up to Nell on the sidewalk at a most random time and says, I know everything has been going on because I've been following you. Come with me. Oh, okay. Ashley Bell has proven to be a good actress, and when she's not seeing how many grotesque ways she can tort her body, she's very charming and has a sweet charisma. Believe it or not, she even received an Independent Spirit Award nomination for her performance in the first Last Exorcism movie. Here, though, she is all kinds of wrong in the horror scenes. She tries, but nothing is able to take you, to help you take any of this seriously. Remember the game on Whose Line? When they are given a scene to play out, but they're only allowed to use two different lines? I think Ashley was playing that game throughout this movie, and only the only two lines she could use are, Oh my God! and Gasp! Another major problem with this movie, an overdose of familiarity. I'll go ahead and start off with a scene where a bunch of birds fly into the house all at once and die. Just like I really felt like I wrote about this scene. Oh yeah, I did! Last week's Dark Skies! Okay, they're so close together, there's no way the writer of this movie could have known about that scene in Dark Skies. However, there's a scene where Ashley answers the phone and only hears herself say exactly what she just said back to her. A scene lifted directly from Scream 3. How about the scene where the demon attempts to seduce Nell in exactly the same fashion Elizabeth Hughes' sex dream sequence with Kevin Bacon and Holler Man? Which turns into a shot directly from Paranormal Activity 4. This is also not limited to the stifled laugh I got when Nell wanders into the night calling for Chris, in which a demonic voice responds, We're not Chris! Causing me to relive a memory from an old Rugrats episode in the Dreamtime. Though some audiences were underwhelmed, myself and a fair share of critics got a kick out of the first movie. Sure, it was another in the cr crop of found footage movies, but it did effectively and was chock full of genuine scares and creeps. And say what you will about found footage movies, but get this, found footage movies don't have scores, thus are extremely limited on those damn jump scares. Also, despite the ridiculousness of the concept of possessions, the most startling thing about the original is how real it makes it all seem. The idea to make a sequel, let alone Blair Witch said sequel, should have been neutralized before it was too late. So filmmakers, I managed to sit through your movie. So now, if you don't mind, I do ask for a couple of favors. First off, I understand these movies are shot on practically no budget. I mean, it's kind of obvious you can't afford an effect to show us the demon so it can only be seen in the form of other actors. However, maybe you can shell out just a little more to get yourself better writers and a better director. And lastly, when you say the last exorcism, can you please mean it this time? So that would be AJ's Weekend Movie Reviews. And tomorrow, we're going to talk Celebrity Apprentice and TNA Lockdown. So it's going to be uh, a fun time. So... Thanks for watching, and until tomorrow, that's all I got to say about that.